today uh, we'll be uh, uh, looking at this tutorial on crypto asset analytics that we've prepared for you. Um, and we'll cover a wide range of um, topics, uh, mostly how to deal with the data, fundamentals, uh, and open source tools. Um, uh, the two presenters um, are myself, Gitan Victor, and uh, Bernhard Haselhofer. Um, and uh, we'll briefly introduce ourselves on the next slide. Um, so my name is Friedhelm Victor. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Technische Universität Berlin. Um, I'm uh, yeah, close to finishing my PhD and I'm, I'm mostly focused on analyzing crypto asset networks, um, developing methods uh, to better understand them. Uh, and uh, I've added here two, two pictures on the left-hand side. Um, that demonstrates some of my recent work. Um, so on the top left, for example, uh, you see uh, yeah, small graphs that illustrate wash trading activity on uh, decentralized exchanges within crypto asset networks. Uh, and on the bottom left, you see an image of uh, the result of address clustering heuristics that I've developed. Um, and at a later part in this tutorial, we'll, we'll briefly get back to that as well. Um, overall, uh, my research interests are in financial transaction analysis in general, um, and this is where I've actually started out originally, um, but then moved to uh, yeah, decentralized and quantitative finance, specifically uh, um, blockchain-based uh, networks. Um, but, but one of the key things that I find very interesting are, is fraud detection um, and large-scale graph visualization. Okay, thank you. Then it's probably my turn. Um, my name is uh, Bernard Haselhofer. Uh, I have a background in computer science, so I did my PhD there. And um, currently, I'm leading the crypto finance research group at the Complexity Science Hub Vienna. And uh, throughout the past years, um, my research interests have been in the field of basically applying data science methods on, on large graphs and analyzing crypto assets and data um, basically originating from the crypto asset ecosystem has somehow become my major application area throughout the past seven years, I would say. And as part of this work, um, I also started developing an open source platform for crypto asset analytics, it's called GraphSense, roughly five years ago. Uh, and I'm still developing this. Um, and leading the development there. And just this year, uh, we noticed that there is increasing interest um, in using these techniques and also the platform. So we also decided to create a spin off to provide professional support around this open source analytics software. And this spin off is called Ignaio. So I'm also one of the co founders in this. And what really interests me most at the moment in, in our research group at the Complexity Science Hub. <clears throat> is actually um, systemic risk um, associated with um, crypto assets. So we see that crypto assets are getting increasingly intertwined with the traditional financial sector. And understanding uh, this intertwinedness and also understanding how potential issues on either side could propagate to the other side. I think this is um, what I personally found really interested really interesting in what we are focusing on at the moment at the complexity science hub but otherwise my research interests i would say are very similar to free terms this is also why we met a couple of years ago and why um, we are doing a lot of joint work in this field i think in general uh, before we go uh, into the contents i see that we are a fairly small group so we have nine participants which means um, we can do this tutorial really interactively. Um, whenever you have a question, you don't even have to raise your hand. Just unmute yourself and shout. Um, for us, it's much more important to answer your questions uh, than going through, going, than going strictly through our program. So please, really feel free to ask whatever your question have in mind, and we are completely flex flexible 
there are certain parts in this tutorial we, we can skip, for instance, if, if we see that questions from the audience are coming, because as again, again, as I said, it's much more important to answer your questions. Okay, um, and by the way, um, you also use the chat. So one of us, so we are two in this tutorial, Friedhelm and myself, and one of us will always have an eye on the chat. Um, so if you don't want to interrupt, at least use the chat. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, the title of this tutorial is Crypto Asset Analytics. And I assume uh, many of you are familiar, familiar with the term, have read about this in the news. Um, but still, I, I find it quite uh, useful at the beginning of, of such a tutorial uh, to clarify what we, the tour organizers, uh, understand when we're talking about crypto assets. Um, why do we need to clarify this? Because there is no generally adopted definition for this. So you find a lot of definitions in policy papers, um, sometimes created by policymakers, uh, sometimes lacking some technical backgrounds. So what we did is we basically came up with our own working definitions over the year, which is still in flux, but this is at least what you're using right now. And we, when we talk about crypto assets, understand as a crypto asset, something that's exchangeable, that's virtual, that uses cryptography, so mostly uh, hash, hash algorithms, public key cryptography, and that represents some economic resource or value to someone um, and generally builds on some blockchain technology. So this is our working definition. And so far, <clears throat> um, working with this definition worked pretty well throughout the past years. And examples for crypto assets are, as you probably know, Bitcoin, uh, derivatives of Bitcoin like Litecoin, but also privacy coins like Zcash, Monero, or um, coins or tokens you find on the Ethereum chain. If we look um, into the spectrum of crypto assets and try to somehow categorize um, the set of available assets, um, we can roughly distinguish between two types of crypto assets. One type is what we call uh, native cryptocurrencies. And there we can again distinguish between uh, transparent uh, cryptocurrencies and privacy focused cryptocurrencies. Uh, instances or examples for transparent cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin and uh, altcoins like Litecoin. And privacy focused cryptocurrency examples are, for instance, Monero, which is probably the most prominent one, and Zcash. On the other side of the spectrum, we also see another type of crypto assets, which is called token. And there we can again distinguish between fungible tokens and non-fungible token. The, the, the big difference between fungible and non-fungible token is this property of inter-exchangeability. Uh, so fungible tokens are inter-exchangeable, non-fungible tokens, also called NFTs, are uh, not inter-exchangeable. Um, and you probably read a lot about NFTs in the news in recent years. So it's, it's for instance, used for um, um, auctioning artworks recently. Why is this um, distinction between native cryptocurrencies and tokens important? Because it has uh, also some, some technical uh, implications. And of course, technical implications also have an influence on the analytics methods um, that can be applied. Uh, so for this reason, it's also important to make this distinction. And uh, when we look into native cryptocurrencies, we see, okay, they are uh, mostly built on um, blockchain technology that's basically um, derived from the design of Bitcoin. And these ledgers are called UTXO model ledgers. And on the other side, we have account model ledger ledgers with Ethereum being the most prominent example. So again, this is important to know because the analytics method uh, methods you can apply uh, really depend on the technology underneath and we have those two main families at the moment yeah um analyzing crypto assets gets really interesting at least in my opinion when we do not consider a crypto asset as being some atomic unit that's floating around somewhere but when we consider a crypto asset as something that's being uh, bought, sold, traded, used to buy or purchase uh, goods and services, 
um, could be illegal or legal services. Um, that's actually something that that's that's being exchanged between different type of actors. And when we talk about crypto asset ecosystems, um, we basically understand uh, as be a crypto asset ecosystem as being a community of actors who interact as a system and are linked together through crypto asset transfers. And what crypto asset analytics uh, aims at is really understanding um, what's going on in this crypto asset ecosystem. This, of course, depends a lot on the research question uh, you're asking. Um, yeah, why is it important? Um, again, we are working on this topic for so myself more than seven years now, and uh, we found that there are a number of use cases um, that uh, rely on developing and applying some quantitative methods to understand uh, properties of this crypto asset ecosystem. First, there's of course our market understanding. You know that bitcoins and other tokens have achieved quite some uh, market capitalization. Um, so there is a lot of money involved, uh, to keep it short. Um, and as soon as there's money involved, there's, of course, a natural uh, need for understanding uh, how the market looks like, how the market involves. So market understanding is naturally uh, a primary application area. Then we also have law enforcement because not all um, crypto asset transactions are legal. So unfortunately, crypto assets like Bitcoin are also used uh, for illegal purposes for purchases of illegal goods and services in the darknet, for instance. And um, law enforcement uh, also applies um, crypto asset analytics or forensic techniques uh, to track or trace um, illegal funds from one actor to the other. Um, in recent years, we also noticed that uh, crypto asset analytics is getting increasingly important for protocol designers. So those who are working on new protocols to improve, for instance, uh, issues associated with the blockchain technology like throughput or uh, energy consumption. Um, they also need analytics techniques to, to measure how existing systems uh, behave in the wild. Um, and um, the techniques we're presenting today are, uh, I would say, one, one of the building blocks that can be applied for better understanding how um, blockchain ecosystems or blockchain systems behave in reality. And finally, everyone, at least in, in, in most uh, in many jurisdictions in this world, anyone who runs some form of um, crypto asset business, for instance, a crypto asset exchange where you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies or crypto assets, um, should or must nowadays uh, think about, about uh, anti-money anti laundry regulation uh, and implement compliance measures. For instance, understanding uh, where a certain transaction comes from. So KYT and AML are terms that are always used in this context. And in Europe, for instance, and also in the US, uh, we see a lot of regulation coming up, really imposing quite strict measures uh, on virtual asset service providers like crypto asset exchanges. So they're approaching, let's say, um, density of regulation. It's uh, very similar uh, to the banking sector. So these are just four examples where we observe that crypto asset analytics is important. Uh, there's, of course, more, but I think the four serve as a good starting point. Friedhelm, do you want yeah, to? Yeah, so we can... Post? We can view crypto asset analytics also in the in the wider scope of uh, distributed ledger analytics, which uh, may also cover aspects that don't have anything to do with uh, assets, um, because there are, for example, underlying uh, functionalities um, on the peer to peer level or related to governance um, yeah, functionality uh, that don't necessarily involve measurable um, crypto assets. And so here you see, uh, for example, uh, a taxonomy um, that I've um, previously proposed where the field could be structured uh, into four quadrants um, on transaction analysis, smart contracts, analytics, um, value analytics, and governance analytics. And each of these fields kind of have their own um, individual focus points. And if we want to position crypto asset analytics um, in this, uh, then we could put it, um, if you click 
Bernhard, um, we could put it at the bottom left there because the main um, intersections, I would say, are with um, yeah, the analysis of value related to assets because assets typically have value. Um, but they also can have intersections with these other components because sometimes governance processes um, have yeah, value components to them. For example, if you think about um, bribing, that is uh, yeah, a, a phenomenon that has recently appeared. Um, but I'll leave it at this um, and uh, let's continue. Okay, thank you. Um, just to give you an example, um, what could be done uh, with the techniques um, we are showing you today. Uh, we picked two studies uh, we worked on in the past. The first one is um, one I, where in which I collaborated with uh, criminologists. And what we tried to understand actually back in 2018, um, so 2018 was the time when, when ransomware really started to become a big issue and Bitcoin was back then and is still um, the main means of payment uh, for ransomware, um, for ransomware um, uh, payments, basically. And what we tried to understand back then, since there were no reliable numbers, um, we wanted to understand what the global direct financial impact of ransomware attacks was. So how much uh, the, the ransomware attackers actually make by running such attacks and how the overall uh, market structure looks like. So those were our guiding research questions. And what we did is, uh, of course, we collected data from the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, we gathered some so-called attribution tags, which told us something about the real world nature of the actors involved. Um, so we gathered, for instance, uh, information about Bitcoin addresses of victims. And then we used um, GraphSense and uh, yeah, standard analytics tools like our notebook for Pi or Jupyter notebooks. Um, to 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 basically basically analyze our data and answer uh, our research questions. I'm not going into all the details, just picking out uh, some examples. So what we found, for instance, is that just by looking into um, the transactions associated with uh, some ransomware family, you can really nicely monitor if you want in real time. Uh, how a certain ransomware attack evolves just by the financial transactions that are associated with them. So for instance, here you see WannaCry, so, which was a, a ransomware attack back in 2017. And we really see nicely how the payments uh, grew until the so-called kill switch was activated uh, around mid 2017. And you see this nicely in the data. And in theory, you could also really monitor this in real time. If you compare this with some other form of ransomware family, which uh, targets uh, large institutions like hospitals or government institutions, um, at least back then we saw, okay, the payments are much larger, of course, because they're targeting institutions and the, the ransomware attack was, was still going on uh, while we were writing those papers. So this is all clear today. We have 2022 20 now, but in 2018, um, this was not so clear. And we also, quantified the, the market of ransomware. So we found which uh, ransomware attacks made how much money. And, the, um, and, and we did an analysis for, for many ransomware families, I think for 35 different ransomware families. And we also found that this market is highly skewed. That means only a few attacks are really successful and make some money, uh, whereas the majority of attacks uh, doesn't uh, make much money. This is also important because if people uh, or organizations like law enforcement have to start thinking which attacks to 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 deal with, um, you should usually focus on the on the big families on, on the big family on the families that cause uh, most damage. The other study, Friedhelm, that's yours. Yeah. So um, if you look at the picture in the middle, it's a screenshot from an article from two thousand nineteen that states for 15K US dollars, uh, you'll fake your exchange volume and you will get on coin market cap. So this was an article basically saying, um, it's possible to get your own token listed on one of the uh, most visited websites, namely coin market cap, to get some popularity, to receive some attention. Um, and the way this works is that, uh, yeah, trading volume on centralized exchanges is being faked. Uh, so they create multiple accounts and just trade with each other. 
Now, in uh, the past years, um, apart from centralized exchanges, also decentralized exchanges have emerged. Um, and this was as early as 2017 on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. Um, and so the, the research question that we had here was, um, is such um, manipulative behavior, meaning wash trading, does that exist on these decentralized exchanges as well? And if so, how could it be detected? And so uh, that's what we did. We looked at two of the earliest decentralized exchanges, IDEX and Ether Delta. Um, they're not used much today anymore. Um, today it's more like Uniswap uh, and SushiSwap and some others, but uh, the, the, the benefit was that we could look at um, yeah, the exact trading behavior between accounts. Um, and so we were able to identify patterns in which uh, these um, traders operated and kind of exchanged these assets back and forth to increase trading volume. And we're able to show that yeah, up to 30% of all the tokens that were traded on these um, exchanges uh, yeah, had, had seen wash trading. Um, so if you, if you click Bernhardt, um, you can also see, uh, these, these images, right. Of these patterns and some summary statistics, which are too many to go into, uh, but I've already mentioned it. And so, so this, this paper was, was published last year with the web conference. Okay. Thank you, Frieden. Yeah. And, um, so we did, these were just two examples um, we did of, of studies we did in the past, and they basically all have in common that um, you start by collecting some data, and then you apply some some analytic techniques. Um, and reg regarding tape data, um, we can uh, roughly distinguish uh, between two types of data sets. So the first one is on-chain data, and what you can gather there is, of course, uh, blocks from the publicly available uh, blockchains, from the Bitcoin blockchain, for instance, or the Ethereum blockchain, um, which are essentially uh, containers of transactions. So you get um, all the transactions that happened in the past by simply uh, gathering them uh, from the publicly available blockchains. Um, more interesting is are of course uh, the individual transactions because they uh, send funds from one actor to the other. They can also call uh, so-called smart contracts on the Ethereum chain and do all sorts of other stuff, especially in the Ethereum context. So transactions are probably one of the most important and interesting data point uh, to look into. And um, we also have, uh, on, especially in the Ethereum blockchain, um, which is much more powerful than the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, we have um, special accounts which are actually capable of running programs, so-called smart contracts. And they also, uh, of course, contain uh, interesting data points. Um, yeah, this is what I already mentioned. So we have smart contracts, uh, especially in the Ethereum chain. Then um, when we look into off-chain data, um, there are also several important data sets. First of all, so-called attribution data. This, uh, this data is uh, used for um, associating, um, for instance, Bitcoin addresses that are per se anonymous or pseudonymous uh, with, uh, ident or with, with information about uh, the real world actor, for instance, uh, the name of an exchange um, where um, a certain, uh, uh, that controls a certain Bitcoin address. So this is important information to associate uh, uh, patterns observed in the chain um, with the real world. Then, is of, then there's of course exchange rates and uh, trade related data. Um, Bitcoin and other crypto assets are traded on public or on public um, trading platforms and exchanges for exchange rates. And if you are interested in um, trading volumes, in US dollar or Euro, you of course have to do the conversion and uh, gather this data from somewhere. And um, especially when we look into the Ethereum blockchain, where we find uh, smart contracts um, that are essentially programs that can be invoked by transactions. 
Um, it's also sometimes important to associate the, the functionality of the programs with some semantics because it's sometimes not given by default. And also for this, um, there are external data sources that, for instance, help resolving the function signatures of smart contracts to better understand what the smart contract is actually doing. So these are examples for data sets for on-chain and off-chain data sets that can be gathered and we will uh, cover uh, actually most of them in today's tutorial. Then um, data gathering is just the first step. And the second step, um, you need um, some tools um, and there is no single tool that solves all the problems. Um, so what we usually do is we use a set of tools. So standard and, uh, statistics and analytics environments like R or, or Jupyter Python or um, graph, um, graph analytics um, tools like Gephi or the graph databases like Neo4j um, are really useful for doing these sorts of analysis um, based on uh, what some underlying tools um, it gives us this output. So for analyzing UTXO model ledgers, there are two open source um, implementations available. One is uh, BlockSci, which is a Python library for analyzing um, uh, Bitcoin-like blockchains uh, in memory. So it's really rather a low-level um, tooling one can use to apply uh, the most important, but also most basic analytics methods we will talk about today. Then there is GraphSense. This is um, the open source software that's um, developed by us. This is actually a full stack, uh, a full stack data science stack um, that aggregates data from different sources, um, puts data into a distributed database, allows you to query data using uh, Spark, or some external or some 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 external tools via our API, etc. So this is what we will focus on today. And for account model ledgers, we also have um, different open source tools available. Um, the most important one for extracting data from the Ethereum chain is uh, Ethereum ETL, which uh, will be explained by Friedhelm uh, in the second part of the tutorial today. So again, this is important. Or this explains again why we made the distinction between UTXO model ledgers and account model ledgers at the beginning, because it's really important also for the types of analytics procedures and for the types of tools uh, you apply. Uh, so applying blockchain um, ETL or the Ethereum ETL uh, tool for Bitcoin, for instance, uh, won't work uh, directly. Yeah, um, and these are the aims of our tutorial. So at the very beginning, um, so actually right now, I will uh, give a very brief uh, introduction to crypto assets and blockchain. Um, I assume that many of you have heard about this before, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I will repeat um, the most important concepts. Then, uh, within the first session of this tutorial, um, I will explain how UTXO model ledgers, um, Bitcoin and, um, and, uh, and currencies working similar to, similar to Bitcoin um, can be analyzed uh, using open source tools. And in the second part of our tutorial, Friedhelm will then focus on analyzing account model ledgers and also give an outlook on um, uh, research questions, issues um, uh, we are discovering or we think are important uh, to deal with in near future. And the overall goal is, of course, to teach how to use uh, these systems and methods for analyzing um, crypto asset ecosystems and for answering um, specific research questions at the end of the day. Um, regarding um, the technical level of this tutorial, um, so we really um, try to start from the very basics. So we also try to um, not lose anyone who has never heard about Bitcoin or doesn't know uh, how the underlying technology works. So this is what why we, why we introduced this Bitcoin 101 at the very beginning. But of course, uh, we also want to uh, reach the level of a skilled person who worked with, with cryptocurrencies before and just uh, want to learn, for instance, how to work with graphs or Ethereum ETL uh, using Python. 
So this is the goal for today. And um, unless there are any questions, I would now uh, go over and start with the Bitcoin Cryptocurrencies 101. Are, are there any questions so far? No. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I was muted on the microphone. Uh, I have uh, just uh, two questions. I don't know, maybe you will say later, but uh, I'm not uh, familiar with the um, term UTXO. Um, I will explain, yeah. Okay, thank you. And I was wondering if this uh, distinction is something that you, you are proposing, you, sorry, that you proposed or is it uh, something in literature or uh, technical papers? So a very good question, thank you. Um, it's actually, it's, it's, it, if you look into the spectrum of current blockchain solutions, at least uh, in the public blockchains, you see those two design approaches. One is called uh, UTXO ledgers and the other one is called account ledgers. And you also see it in recent literature. So this is, the terminology that's also used there um, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move on and let's um, start with a very basic example. And this basic example is, I would like to make a donation to the Internet Archive in San Francisco. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit organization and I really like the work. I'm based in Europe and I want to send um, five uh, euros as a donation to the internet archive. And I want to wanna do this with Bitcoin because uh, the banking fees uh, are too high for doing this in the standard um, banking system. And for the moment, we just forget that there are systems like PayPal and other similar solutions. So what we're doing is um, we're creating a transaction so I copied the Internet Archive's Bitcoin address. I said, create a new transaction. Uh, the system I'm using, and this is a blockchain.info, uh, automatically proposes uh, some transaction fee and then um, basically executes tra tra the transaction. So this is how you can uh, create a transaction in Bitcoin. I have to admit that this screencast is already a bit old, as you can see from the exchange rate. Uh, um, in this screencast, so 0 0.08 Bitcoin is nowadays more than just uh, 76 euros, but it doesn't really matter. Important to understand is um, what happens in the background. So when I created this transaction using um, uh, my custodial wallet at blockchain.info, and you can use any other wallet provider service that's out there, what happened is, um, I basically interacted with a service that is attached to the, the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network and uh, also has a local copy of the blockchain. And when I pressed the button and said, uh, create transaction, what happened in the background is actually that the transaction got broadcast um, to the entire global peer -to Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's the transaction is essentially floating around uh, in the so-called mempool and is waiting uh, for being processed. So, and the processing works as follows. Within this global uh, Bitcoin P2P network, there are special nodes called the so-called miners, and they are responsible for uh, processing transactions. So what they do is they are basic, basically listening to this mempool, um, see if there are any pending transactions, uh, collect those pending transactions and then try to find a block um, using some mechanism I will explain later. And as soon as they found a block, that means as soon as they process the transaction, uh, they broadcast the found block to the entire global Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network and each uh, node in the system, also the node I was uh, directly interacting with, then synchronizes itself with this uh, blockchain. So this is the high level bird's eye perspective on how transaction processing works in Bitcoin. And to answer the question before what UTXO means, we have to understand 
uh, how a Bitcoin transaction look like, looks like. So I'm, I assume you're all familiar with a standard banking transaction. So if you send a transaction, if you use a bank to send a transaction to your friend, um, a transaction in the standard banking environment has exactly one source and one target. So the source is you and the target, the destination is your friends. So we have a one-to-one -one relationship. The difference in Bitcoin is that we actually have an end-to-end -end relationship. So we have transactions that uh, consist of a list of inputs and a list of outputs. The outputs uh, basically determine the recipients. So I send uh, a certain amount of Bitcoins to the Internet Archive. So that's the, the upper right output uh, in this figure. And uh, it also contains another output, which actually um, sends back uh, the change um, to one of the addresses I'm controlling myself. Uh, why is this the case? Because uh, if you look at the input side of a transaction, each transaction always has to point um, to previous transactions um, that basically assign uh, value to one of the addresses controlled by myself. Um, so, or to, to, to speak differently, I, I cannot spend money I don't own. So for this reason, I have to have received money as part of my previous transactions. And if I want to create a new transaction, I have to point back to these previous transactions and say, OK, I would like to use these uh, transactions output in this new transaction I'm creating. And of course, these transactions, transaction outputs of previous transactions must be unspent. So because I cannot spend uh, outputs uh, twice. So this is also where the terminology unspent transaction output comes from, because the value um, I control is basically the sum of all unspent uh, transaction outputs I have uh, under control um, with, my, with my keys, with my basically public and private key pairs. It's also important to know that a Bitcoin address is actually nothing else than a public key, or more precisely, a hash of a public key. Um, and of course, um, I can only um, use um, the money or the, the value assigned to a certain public key if I have the corresponding private key. That means if I create a new transaction like this one, I have to sign uh, on the input side uh, in order to reuse um, the previous unspent transaction outputs of previous transactions. And as you saw before in this uh, demo, um, the system automatically assigned transaction fees or a transaction fee, and the transaction fee is automatically computed by the sum of inputs minus the sum of outputs. So this is how a Bitcoin transaction looks like, and this should also explain why it's called unspent transaction output. Just very quickly, uh, an explanation how, how mining works. So uh, the miners that uh, listen to pending uh, uh, transactions, what they do is um, they collect uh, transactions and then they put those transactions, which are essentially just data structures, into a template, um, um, attach some, some header fields to this template, um, for instance, a so-called nonce, which is just just a number basically, and what they what they then do is then they, they apply a hash function in order to compute a hash. So it's very simple. Uh, the only difficulty is that the Bitcoin protocol um, imposes um, some rules, and one rule is um, that the the hash uh, that that's computed um, must have uh, a certain number of leading zero bits. Uh, in order um, to basically uh, fulfill the requirements of the protocol in order to be a valid block. And the only way how to uh, find such a hash, since hashes are one-way functions, is to really apply brute force search techniques. So just try again and again by changing the nonce values um, to find such a hash that matches uh, the criteria imposed by the protocol. And if there is a match, if there's a matching hash, uh, one has found a block and can broadcast the block back to the ecosystem and receive so-called block rewards and can then um, synchronize uh, the block um, with um, 
basically so all the others in the in all the other nodes in the bit computer to be network then synchronize the blocks uh, with their own copy of the local blockchain so that's the idea of mining um which we don't cover uh, in more detail in this tutorial but just to um, basically give give a complete picture so this was the very quick high level introduction on how uh, bitcoin works um, and before i'm moving on to um, basic analytic techniques i'm again asking are there any questions Okay, so let's move on then. Yeah, so now after we have learned the, the basic uh, principles of uh, crypto assets and, and the functionality of a blockchain, um, we are focusing into how one can analyze uh, those so-called UTX or model ledgers. Because again, Bitcoin is just one example of a native cryptocurrency that uh, uses this model. There are also many other uh, native cryptocurrencies that use exactly the same model. And the analytics techniques we apply for Bitcoin can of course also apply it uh, for the other coins that build on the same conceptual model. So this is also why we uh, separated the tutorial into those two parts. Yeah, so this is what I mentioned before. We can, uh, again, um, distinguish the spectrum of crypto assets into native cryptocurrencies and tokens. And we are here really focusing on, 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 on the left-hand part, which was native cryptocurrencies, which can, again, be um, distinguished into transparent and privacy-focused crypto assets. <clears throat> um, when looking into the available methods uh, for analyzing UTX all ledgers, uh, we can again roughly distinguish between two different approaches um, because data occurs on different levels um, of the, uh, I would say, protocol stack of the architecture of um, crypto assets ecosystems. And one can, for instance, uh, look into the lowest level, which is the peer to peer network, and try to understand um, the traffic there. And for instance, analyze. Um, a centrality um, of or centralization uh, issues in, 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 in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin as we did in the past. But this is not what we're focusing today. Today we are rather focusing on blockchain analytic techniques and there um, we can apply two basic methods um, that are, I would say, powerful, especially uh, when being applied in combination. And this is exactly what I would like to show you today. Um, I will explain how these basic uh, techniques works, uh, work, uh, and I will also show you how um, this looks like in practice. And for this purpose, uh, I will use uh, an instance of GraphSense uh, we are hosting uh, at the CNIO. And what I did is I Basically, I, I posted a, an API key uh, into the chat. And if everything goes as expected, you should be able um, to go to or to follow my to follow the steps uh, I'm taking by simply using the same API key. So I hope it works for everyone. It should work for the dashboard and it should also work for the API examples uh, I'm showing later. Okay, so let's get started. So the first um, exercise I would like to show you is um, we are using the GraphSense dashboard to inspect um, a certain um, cryptocurrency address and we're using the address I have shown you before. It's the address of the internet archive. And in order to show you how this works, I'm switching my screen. Just a second. I have to switch to my browser. And what you see here, 
just have to get rid of this box, is um, if you go to app.ignayo, so I can paste the link to the chat, um, you will be asked to enter an API key. And if you take the key I shared via the chat, I'm posting it again, just to make sure it works. Um, you should see um, this landing page. And what you can then do is you enter the Bitcoin address, and I'm using the Internet Archives donation address again, and you see uh, something like this uh, popping up. So what we have here is um, basically the, just a second. So this is the, the address I just entered. This is the Internet Archives uh, donation address. I see that it's uh, uh, an address uh, of Bitcoin. And I also see some uh, statistical uh, summaries uh, for this single address. So I see in how many uh, transactions it was involved in. So it was involved in more than 4,000 uh, receiving transactions and a bit more than 200 sending transactions. It received money um, or it uh, received money from uh, 6,000 other addresses and sent money to 293 other addresses. And it has been active for uh, almost 10 years. So we have it started in 2013 uh, and it's still active. Uh, so yeah, quite a, quite some period um, for, inter, for, for a Bitcoin address, I would say. And uh, here it's getting interesting. We also see how much this uh, single address has received. So over all these eight years, seven months and 14 days, uh, it received roughly 412 uh, Bitcoins and there is uh, a bit more than one Bitcoin left. Of course, we are also interested in understanding uh, how much this is uh, in US dollars, considering uh, historical exchange rates. So what Graphsense does is it's not converting based on today's exchange rate. It really takes each transaction in the past and then takes the historical corresponding exchange rates and then does the aggregation. And we see, okay, at least according to our data, uh, we see that this single donation address received roughly uh, 3 million US dollars. So this is a very basic um, way to get uh, insights on a single uh, crypto asset address and usually also the starting point of an investigation. Going back to my slides. And again, if you enter the API key, uh, you should, it should be possible that you follow my exercises. May I ask, has someone tried? Is someone trying? Any troubles? Okay. Sorry, for me it works. Okay, that's good news. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, a starting point uh, and, and rather trivial. Um, so let's move on and see what other techniques are available and uh, how they are how they look like uh, in GraphSense. <clears throat> so one of the most important techniques um, that's used nowadays, especially in the UTXO analytics part, is address clustering. So you know that anyone can, in theory, create an infinite number of um, Bitcoin addresses because an address is nothing else than a public key, and I can create as many public private key pairs as I want. Um, so it, it's, it's really hard to tell anything about these addresses, but what's possible is to, to cluster these addresses using uh, some um, heuristic techniques and then um, associate um, information about uh, real world actors to these clusters. So one, one can, for instance, associate the information um, that a certain cluster is controlled by some crypto asset exchange uh, like uh, Coinbase or some other um, service. And what one can then do is uh, based on these clusters, uh, one can create a model. We call it the so-called entity graph. That's essentially a network um, that um, represents um, or that models um, the actors and the relationships 
um, involved in this overall crypto asset ecosystem. So this is what we think is the closest possible representation of this uh, real virtual uh, crypto asset ecosystem world. And this is also the type of graph we are really interested in because it, it shows the actors and the relationship between actors. And when we analyze crypto asset e ecosystems, we essentially jump into this graph and analyze um, nodes and, and, and relationships between nodes using some standard network analytic, analytic, an, analytics techniques. Yeah, um, so how does address clustering work? Um, the goal of address clustering is that uh, we group addresses that are likely controlled by the same entity. So an entity can, for instance, be uh, uh, some crypto asset service provider, some crypto asset exchange like Coinbase, or uh, as in our example, uh, the Internet Archive, for instance. Also, the Internet Archive controls more than one addresses, and it would be interesting for us to understand, okay, what are these addresses controlled by this entity, and what information uh, can be derived uh, from these from this clustering? And there are several techniques out there, and I will just uh, point out the most important one, which is the so-called uh, co-spend heuristics. And this is actually a heuristics um, that was proposed by the inventor of Bitcoin himself or itself or herself, I don't know. Um, and it essentially says that um, if, um, if, 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 if someone reuses addresses across transactions, it's possible to link those addresses. And uh, soon after the, this white paper has been released and Bitcoin started, uh, researchers actually already started looking into this uh, and tried to cluster addresses and found that it's actually quite effective. And this technique is nowadays also, I would say, the industry, industry standard uh, in most uh, crypto analytics tools that are out there. How does this work? Just to give you the intuition, let's assume you have uh, one Bitcoin transaction X that has uh, two inputs. Uh, address one and address two. Um, what we can assume is that if, for instance, I um, created transaction X and use transaction uh, and use address one and address two as input, um, I must possess the, the private keys to sign uh, those inputs in order to use them as part of my transaction. That means I must somehow control those addresses. So this is, a, I would say, a fairly safe assumption that someone who creates uh, a transaction must also somehow control the funds he's using as part of this transaction. So we can then make the assumption that these two addresses belong together. If we see another transaction, why? Again, using two addresses, A2 and A3, uh, we can make the same assumption. So we can assume A2 and A3 uh, belong together. And as soon as we see that uh, two addresses are uh, used across clusters, we can, of course, merge the cluster. And this is really powerful because, as we will see uh, in, in, in our tool later, those clusters can be really large, so they can cluster thousands, hundreds of thousands of addresses. Um, and especially for crypto asset exchanges, this works pretty well. So large clusters uh, often represent uh, crypto asset exchanges because there's a lot of address reuse going on there. Yeah, just clustering addresses doesn't tell us anything about the real world nature uh, of the owner. Um, but as soon as we can attribute one of these addresses with some uh, real world information, like for instance, the information that the address is controlled by the Internet Archive or owned by the Internet Archive, um, we can of course also um, infer that all the other addresses in this cluster are controlled by the same owner. And this is um, the technique that's nowadays used to also de-anonymize uh, large clusters like those that are controlled by exchanges. Yeah, going back to GraphSense. Switch again. I just share my entire screen. So now it's easier. So going back to our to, to GraphSense. So before we just investigated a single address. So the, the donation address uh, we, we found on the website. 
and got this uh, statistical summary. Um, what we see in this uh, surrounding box is actually the entire cluster. So if we now put the focus on the entire cluster instead of the single address, we get uh, the summary statistics for the entire cluster. And we see that um, the Internet Archive, at least according to our clustering algorithm, not only controls uh, one address, but uh, several addresses. So this is um, what I meant before. We now have, um, based on our clustering and uh, attribution tags we added to our system, we now have a node that represents an entity in mm -hmm. our ecosystem. And what we can do next is we can, uh, since it's a huge graph, we can uh, traverse those relationships. So we can see um, where the money has been sent to um, and yeah, better understand uh, the relationships between uh, the entities that were uh, involved uh, in, in this. And we can do this for the outgoing side. We can also do it for the ingoing side. So we can check uh, where the money came from. Yeah, so this is the basic idea of, of uh, clustering techniques and also the basic idea of um, using uh, um, crypto as analytic techniques for analyzing UTXO-based UTX lectures. Maybe uh, to also explain where we got the attribution data from. Um, so here you see under, under address tags, you see uh, where this information is coming from. And actually, we gathered uh, the information from the Internet Archive's uh, donation website. So they are publicly announcing the donation address. And simply by using this information, we can pinpoint uh, this address in, in the system and learn about uh, how it has been used uh, in Bitcoin. Are there any questions so far before I move on? Okay, so I've already shown that um, clustering heuristics are important for um, aggregating addresses that are controlled by the same owner, by the same real world entity. But what we would like to have at the end of the day is uh, a network abstraction, uh, which somehow represents uh, the ecosystem and which we can use uh, uh, in order to um, analyze um, the relationships between between actors. So what we want to do is actually want to create uh, network abstractions uh, from the raw data uh, we gather from the blockchain. And there are uh, several types of network abstractions we can use. The most basic type of network abstraction is, of course, the transaction network, which is just a network that where um, a node represents a transaction and a link uh, a pointer between transactions. So I showed you before when I uh, showed you the, uh, the a single Bitcoin transaction, I showed you that the inputs are always pointing back uh, to a previous transaction output. And this is actually where the linkage is coming from. And from this information, you can create the transaction network, which is to some extent interesting, but not really useful more for, for not really useful more so for more sophisticated analysis. And this is also the network uh, you can inspect by using a publicly available blockchain analytic tool. So if you go to blockstream.info, you can enter the hash of a certain transaction, and then you can follow uh, back uh, and forth the transaction chain and see uh, how the transactions are linked with each other. But it doesn't tell you um, much about uh, the relationship between addresses or the relationship between uh, actors in this ecosystem. For this reason, um, um, researchers actually pretty early started um, building higher level uh, network abstractions um, that uh, represent this information um, in an aggregated fashion. And uh, first level of abstraction um, that's interesting for this sorts of analysis is the so-called address network. And in an address network, 
uh, a node represents an address um, and an edge uh, represents um, basically um, the aggregated uh, number of transactions or the aggregated value uh, of bitcoins or any other cryptocurrency that have flown between those uh, addresses. Um, since uh, an address can send money to another address, which can then again send money back to the sending address, um, this entire graph is bidirected and can of course also uh, contain cycles. So the address network is the, the next level of abstraction um, that's, that's interesting in when doing these sorts of analysis. Um, and um, if we go one step further and combine this idea of creating an address network abstraction with this idea of um, applying clustering heuristics to combine our addresses, um, we can even create a higher level of abstraction, which is the so-called entity network. So if we can cluster addresses into so-called entities or clusters of addresses, we can then uh, also uh, basically uh, link those entities with each other and get uh, the so-called entity network, which is, um, I think, the closest uh, possible ecosystem model uh, we can get from the data that's publicly available uh, on, on blockchains. And this is also the model um, we are interested in, in, in analyzing in practice because uh, we are interested in, in, the, in the links, in the transfers between actors um, and in understanding um, um, those links. Yeah, so this is um, what I've already shown before. Uh, here in this graph, you see basically an integrated view of the address graph and the entity graph. So if you want to conduct your analysis on the, on the address level, you can uh, traverse the incoming and outgoing relationships on the address level. So by just clicking on the nodes uh, that are basically contained in the surrounding boxes. Um, so you, you see it here that the links go basically go from address to address. If you're interested in analyzing the entity level, and this is, I would say, usually the more interesting type of analysis, uh, you can uh, simply uh, remain on the address on the entity level. So basically, um, you just using the, the surrounding box. But um, the reason why we integrated these views is because uh, sometimes you really want to understand. Uh, so when you analyze uh, relationships between entities, sometimes you're really interested in the specific addresses that were involved, and then you have to go down to the address level again, or even go down to the trans transaction level again. So this is the reason why GraphSense provides uh, this integrated view. And if you are interested in understanding uh, the specific transactions between addresses or entities, you can click on the link and you see the individual transaction that, uh, or the, the individual transaction or the transactions, because it's, it's an aggregation uh, that were involved uh, in, in this link. So you see, it's a huge graph. Uh, that can be traversed and be used um, to analyze uh, all sorts of questions related to crypto assets. Let me see if I have another example here. Yeah, maybe let's do another example. So I'm now cleaning this view again and start. show you some other example from a sextortions uh, case which we used uh, which we worked on in another paper so what i'm doing now is i'm taking um, one bitcoin address of which we know that it was involved in so-called uh, sextortion spam um, and um, basically was used to to gather uh, money from from victims um, and what you, one can do is one can um, inspect uh, this address, um, see how much money it received. Uh, we can change the currency again, let's do it in, in euros. So we see that this single sextortion spam uh, address uh, received uh, 
roughly 8,000 euros, let's do US dollars, roughly 10,000 US dollars from uh, tw 29 uh, addresses. And we also see that um, this extortion spam address here um, is controlled by something or someone uh, who or that also controls at least uh, 19 other addresses. So this is again the clustering heuristics I've shown you before. And the uh, interesting question is now, for instance, if you're working in a, in a law enforcement environment, uh, where did the money end up? So where was it exchanged uh, for uh, fiat currency? And this is typically done at a cryptocurrency exchange. And what I can now do is I can simply search my graph and going four levels deep and search for a point where uh, the money left the ecosystem again. And here we see um, the tag locked is simply because I'm using a public key, a public API key for Ignio right now. But you see that there are some uh, known exchanges in there. So there's, for, for instance, hobi.com or luna.com or hobi.com for the most important one here. This is an exchange uh, where uh, money ended up. And if uh, law enforcement has to investigate uh, such issues, they typically traverse such a graph until they find a point where the money leaves the ecosystem again. Uh, for crypto asset service providers, it's usually the other way that's interesting. So if they receive money um, from a certain address, they are usually interested where the money is coming from. If there was, for instance, some uh, darknet activities or some darknet marketplaces involved, because it's typically a source where you don't want to receive money from, and you can also do the search in other direction. Honestly, I don't know if, we, if there was a marketplace involved or not, but let's see. But I think you get the point. It's about uh, analyzing this graph and understanding um, how the money flows uh, look like. Okay, so that's it for the demo using the dashboard. Oh, yeah, we actually found a marketplace, but the tag is not public. And via some hops, we found a link to some known uh, document marketplace. Anyway, um, so what we have seen so far is um, a dashboard that's quite useful for uh, analyzing um, single addresses or, or small sets of addresses. But obviously, a dashboard uh, is always uh, limited um, by the visualization um, features it offers. So you can hardly visualize a thousands of addresses on a dashboard or um, present in a way so that the user can effectively process um, the information shown there. Um, and for this reason, we actually built uh, Craftsense as a, as a data science platform with, um, I think, quite powerful API, which you can also use to um, do more automated uh, larger scale uh, analytics uh, on top of this data set. Mm -hmm. And I will now show you um, two uh, Jupyter notebooks that work against the Craftsense API. So here, uh, just a second. Mm -hmm. You go to api.dixnayo, you find an instance of our uh, Craftsense API and the available uh, API methods you can call from whatever um, um, client uh, environment you want. Um, the Craftsense API also follows the open API standard. That means you can also compile a client in, in many other languages. We did it for a Python and I think we also have an R a client, which is, I think, a bit outdated, but we're working on this. But the idea is, uh, instead of uh, clicking through the dashboard, which is nice, but only scales to a limited extent, one can also use, uh, for instance, a Jupyter notebook to um, gather data about um, uh, Bitcoin addresses in this case. And I prepared two notebooks. The first one is very simple. It just does what we did on the dashboard, 
in, it inspects uh, a single Bitcoin address. So what we do is um, we load uh, the graphs and uh, Python API, which um, can be installed by just cloning the corresponding GitHub repository and installing the Python library. Then we uh, also for this API, we need an API key and you can use the same uh, you used for the dashboard because the dashboard itself is just another API client. So it's the same underlying mechanism. So you can use this, this key to access the API. Mm -hmm. Then you have to configure uh, the CraftSense uh, client, the Python library. So you, so you have to tell it uh, where the host is and what the API key is. And then you can test your connection by simply uh, trying to get the, the summary statistics that, that's also shown on the Ignio uh, landing page. So this is a, a good test case to see if, if, if your connection is working. And then you can use uh, the address API to just query uh, summary statistics for a single address. So I'm now querying um, basically all the summary statistics for the internet archive. So this is essentially, if I'm going back to this example, this is essentially the, the properties you find in this box. So you can simply query it uh, using the, the Python API and do whatever you want to do, for instance, computing uh, how much money it received. What you can then do, uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a very common workflow, that you start from a single address and then you immediately jump on the entity level. So you basically jump on the level of the surrounding box because you're typically interested in the summary statistics for the entire entity. Uh, so you can uh, gather a statistical summary uh, for the corresponding entity, which is again, uh, this property box. And the way how you do it is you just execute another call and you get again, uh, summary statistics uh, represented as a JSON object. And you can, again, do uh, whatever computation you want to do. For instance, um, split out uh, how many addresses are controlled by this entity, how much it received, etc. And um, you can apply or um, also um, traverse uh, the neighborhood of a certain entity. So you can uh, check the incoming and outgoing um, entities, just as I did here, the user interface. So you can gather uh, this list of incoming entities or this list of outgoing entities uh, by simply executing um, another call. And um, what I'm doing here is um, instead of querying a single data point, I'm actually querying uh, a set of data points and uh, a more convenient way of doing this is of course uh, using data frames. So when I'm listing the entity neighbors, um, I'm not interested in getting um, individual data points. I'm really interested in um, getting something that can then be uh, converted in a data frame. Uh, and for this reason, uh, GraphSense offers the so-called uh, bulk API uh, interface, which can uh, easily be uh, converted into data frames uh, on the client side. And then you can continue working uh, with data frames and do uh, whatever uh, you want to do. So this was a very simple example how to gather um, the information you also see on the dashboard. Uh, in the example, I did it just for a single address, but you can obviously imagine that you can also do it for a large number of addresses, which we will do in the second example. Before I continue, are there any questions? Oh, sorry, can I, I think it's a good moment. Yeah. Um, so I noted down some things. So um, first question I wanted to ask what uh, was uh, the orange coloring in the dashboard? What did it stand for? I saw that not all, all the nodes were orange colored when you expanded. Um... Yeah, it's a very good question. So what we have is 
Um, so let's open this. So in crypto assets, addresses are by default anonymous. So you don't know anything about those addresses except um, the address itself, right? Um, but sometimes you have additional uh, information uh, about an address. For instance, here I know that this address is controlled um, by the Internet Archive. So this is an attribution tag I'm adding to this address. And what we also have is uh, we have some categorization information here. So for instance, here we say, OK, this is an organization. And uh, what we have is we're having certain color codes for different types of entities. So there might be uh, marketplaces, exchanges, different types of entities. And what we're doing is we are coloring them using different colors. And if we do not know anything about a certain address or a certain entity, they remain gray. Oh, OK. Thank you. Okay. So gray means we don't know anything. Uh, color means we know something. Okay. Uh, I will uh, uh, take it the chance since uh, I know it appeared with this uh, tag locked. I was curious if it, what uh, you said something about the public key. If you could expand uh, why is it uh, related? Yeah. So the, the API key uh, I shared with you. So again, uh, you're using um, an instance hosted. Um, by, by our spin-off. And there we have public data and, and private data. And with the public API key, you can work with all our public data, but we also have some private data in there, which we are not allowed to share. And this is why it's not visible with this public API key. It's just a matter of um, access control. Okay, thank you. And um, two more things, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I was uh, wondering how much, uh, so I look uh, in two, two things, sorry. Uh, number one, if uh, how much, uh, how often, sorry, is it uh, updated since uh, we have aggregated uh, information? Mm -hmm. And uh, if one can make, uh, let's say, uh, temporal queries, right? So I'll say I'm interested in uh, the first two years um, and obtain the aggregated values in that span time frame. Uh, very good question. So the question to answer how often it's updated the answer is it depends how often we, we trigger it right so again we are hosting an instance and uh, we're we are mostly using it for analytics and forensic purposes uh, so we are updating it uh, once a week but in theory you can run it nightly uh, or even more often depends on the hardware infrastructure you have um, and what we currently look into is in really making it more real time so that at least uh, the basic statistics are computed in real time and the summary statistics that really are computed over the entire data set are uh, they, they will always have a little delay because uh, we're crunching uh, quite a number of transactions here so you see it's actually uh, several it, it, it's it's a huge data set and also the graph i think has billions so we have different graph abstractions and we're talking about billions of nodes and edges and just computing statistics takes i think nine hours at the moment but there is room for improvement okay thank you and uh, about the temporal uh, uh, filters or queries so you can at the moment you cannot do it on the dashboard so um, there is no feature that supports this at, on the dashboard uh, at the moment it's on our plan to implement it for the future also on the dashboard of, but of course uh, since we have control over the entire data sets and since we have everything in our database we can naturally query it as well we just don't expose it on the user interface and the way how we typically do this is uh, we work against the api But what we imagine for the future is to, when you have, um, for instance, a graph on the user interface, that we also um, provide a slider where you can basically restrict uh, the temporal dimension of your analysis. So, so, so uh, we one can do it, but through the Jupyter notebooks, but not yet on the dashboard. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, with the API, you can do 
anything. I mean, you, you, it might always require that you apply some filtering on the client side. Okay, um, okay. thank you. Um, hey, Bernard, uh, this is Rajit. Uh, I have a yeah. question. Um, so uh, what I understand is it's like basically your data is coming from crowdsourced information that's available on on the internet, right? Uh, when you're talking about the attribution data, right? So this yes. year, for instance. Yes, yes exactly. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I would say that it's all crowdsourced data. So the the authenticity of of that data is is still bit low or bit high I mean like uh, how can can we characterize it and the other question is like how do you store internally such data so like is it in some uh, graph database or is it in some like MongoDB or, or some, some SQL system so to, to answer your first question how we um, collect the attribution data so this is our github repository for graph sense and there is a dedicated one called graph sense tech packs and there you find um, tech packs um, created from different sources. So for instance, this one here is created from the US Treasury OFAC sanctions list, which is, I would say, pretty reliable. Um, so we list all the addresses that are contained there. So it's, an, I would say, a pretty reliable source. Um, but what we also have is um, we have um, confidence scores. So we basically manually assign confidence scores. Um, I think it's in the developer branch. Uh, you, you will see it if, if, if you look into the data that uh, different types of data have different confidence scores. And a manually created transaction has a higher confidence score than, for instance, a crawl uh, on the web. So this is how we deal with this issue of data reliability. And to answer your second question, how we store the data. Um, so we started working on this seven years ago, and I think we made all the mistakes one can make. So we started with uh, a relational database and noticed pretty early that uh, given the amount of data and also the dimensionality of the graphs, we're computing that it's not sufficient. Then we started working with graph databases. Basically, same results, um, too slow for our purpose. And we finally ended up uh, at using Apache Cassandra uh, as a NoSQL store for storing the node and edge lists. And we use Apache Spark for uh, pre-computing the summary statistics uh, for all the nodes and edges. So it's, it's actually a mixture between some ETL pipeline and, and the Spark job that does the computation. This is the current architecture. And yeah, it works. It works pretty well. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have three minutes left. Uh, and I just would like to point you to our to the second notebook I'm including uh, in this tutorial for UTX full edge analysis. And this is a tutorial that actually walks you through uh, analyzing through an analysis of many addresses that are involved, were involved in uh, sextortion um, emails. And it's taken from one of our studies. So we're just taking a subset of, I don't know, I think it's uh, 245 addresses. And it nicely shows you how you can use the graphs and Spark API to investigate uh, more than one addresses. So I'm here investigating, investigating 245 rows uh, at a time. And yeah, um, I'm basically mapping those addresses uh, to entities. I'm applying some basic uh, sanity checks on the data I'm gathering, uh, eliminating some outliers, um, then compute, um, over those entities I found and consider reliable how much they received. Then I inspect uh, where did the money come from, where did the money go to. So for instance, here in this data frame, you see uh, on which exchanges uh, the victims probably had their wallets uh, from which they sent the money. And then on the other side, you see where the money went. And then this notebook also shows you um, how you can then uh, create graph representations from the data you gather. 
So I would recommend if you're interested in learning more about how to use the API and especially the data frame capability of the API, which I personally find very useful because I like to work with data frames instead of JSON objects, um, then I highly recommend to go through this notebook, which should be pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so it's uh, 3.30 and we are approaching the end of this session. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, we're now at the third part uh, of this tutorial. Um, so we've uh, seen in the beginning uh, a 101 introduction to crypto assets and blockchain and in the past session the analysis of UTXO model ledgers and now we'll look at uh, account model ledgers. Um, the most prominent example of which I would say is Ethereum. So to recap briefly um, in the UTXO model transactions can have multiple source and target addresses and a uh, transaction is therefore said to have multiple inputs and outputs. And an output that hasn't been spent yet is an unspent transaction output, so a UTXO, uh, and each UTXO is owned by some address. And clients, like a Bitcoin node that you may be running, uh, keeps track of all of these UTXO. So in the account model, um, this is slightly different. Um, in the account model, every transaction has only a single source and target account that it interacts with. And there are fundamentally uh, two different types of accounts. There are externally owned accounts, which we'll abbreviate with EOA. Um, and these are typically regular user wallets that are owned by some private key, similar to how it works in the Bitcoin world. Um, and then there are smart contract code accounts, which we'll abbreviate with CA. And these accounts can contain code that is executable through transactions. Um, so on the left here, you can see regular transaction from one UA to another, or a transaction from some UA to some code account. And I'm kind of marking these with these letters and lots of uh, code inside. So uh, in the account model, um, we have uh, sm these smart contracts um, and uh, the most common a virtual machine that's used for these smart contracts is the Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM. And this is a quasi Turing complete machine. Um, and it means qu quasi Turing complete means that it's, it's not, it doesn't allow you to run infinite loops, for example, because computation is actually bounded through a gas parameter that limits the total computation capacity per block. So not per individual transaction that tries to execute something, but overall transactions in a single block. And you can find all the details of that in the Ethereum yellow paper. There are quite a number of other chains that have adopted the Ethereum virtual machine, such as the Binance Smart Chain or the Avalanche C Chain and a couple of other ones. And the nice thing about that is if you develop a smart contract for the EVM, that means you can deploy it on these other blockchains just as well. So, in the account model, we keep track of state changes. So I previously said in the UTXO model, we usually keep track of all of these UTXO. Um, in the account model, it's, it's the state changes. So a transaction, like here again on the top, may have a couple of properties. So it calls some, some target account. It usually specifies some value that's being sent. So for example, one ether, or can also send zero ether. And it usually needs to pay for some transaction costs. So, so the network fees that the miners can earn. Um, and these are specified by a combination of gas limit, price, priority fee, and so on. Too much to go into. Um, all of that you can read in, in the yellow paper, for example. And then it can has, have some input data um, for the function that it calls. And so I've, I've visualized us on the bottom left here so in the middle, we have this transaction with all of these properties that I've just mentioned. And so uh, prior to the execution of that transaction, the, uh, the, the ledger has some global state. So every 
account, for example, has a certain balance, how much ether it has. And then uh, each smart contract account also has lots of state variables that it can keep track of. And uh, if, if this transaction is then executed, so to some smart contract, then these values, so what uh, each account owns in terms of ether may change. So for example, the sender of that transaction now suddenly has a little less ether and the miner of this transaction may get this as a, yeah, as a mining reward. And then the smart contract that this transaction interacted with may have internal state changes. So some state variable changes to 52 or maybe even some new state variables appear. And so a client um, of these account model blockchains, they, they keep track of the, all, all of these state changes and to what extent they do that depends on um, the type of client. Um, so there are different types, light, full, archive ones, um, and we'll briefly look at this in a later slide. In the account model, there are also internal transactions, and uh, these allow for more complex interactions. Um, so as I've said, uh, every transaction always needs to originate from some EOA account, um, but smart contracts can talk to each other. And they do that essentially by, yeah, you can imagine it like sending transactions to one another. Now, they are also sometimes uh, called messages that they send to each other, or the set of these messages are sometimes called traces. So uh, you can imagine that uh, if some EOA calls this code account, then that code account may call some other code account, and that one in turn some other code account. And they can call functionality, but they can also just send uh, value also back to some other EOA, for example. Um, all that is possible, and that is how you would be able to yeah, uh, have transactions that have multiple outputs, for example, similar to the UTXO world. In addition, um, smart contracts can also emit events. So depending on how the uh, uh, developer of a smart contract implements it, um, they can say, okay, uh, if this function is executed, then please also emit an event. And so uh, this can look something like this. Um, so some transaction is being sent to this code account and then it emits three events, two times a transfer and then some sync event, for example. And uh, these events are, were originally designed um, to be used for user interfaces, like the wallet MetaMask, for example, so that users can kind of easily see, okay, something happened that's sort of a higher level event or action that has been performed um, and the underlying transactions don't need to be parsed um, to understand what, what actually happened. Um, but there is a caveat, um, these events don't necessarily reflect the underlying state changes. They mostly do, but if a smart contract developer really intends to do that, he may choose to emit events even though the underlying state changes don't correspond with what's really happening. Um, but in general, looking at these events um, makes it very easy uh, to perform analysis uh, on sort of higher level uh, concepts that are happening within smart contracts. Now, there are a variety of network abstractions that we can build similar to what we've seen in the previous session on UTXO letters. So you could have um, yeah, regular transaction networks, you could have uh, EOA to EOA networks or just the smart contract networks. And finally, you could have event-based networks um, that yeah, kind of uh, cover a higher level of, of interaction that, that is happening. Um, and finally, of course, also similar to how it works in the UTXO world, you could have networks of entities. So once address clustering heuristics have been applied. So to get a bit more practical, um, how can you access data like that and how can you work with it? So the one of the very popular choices that, that people go for um, recently is using Google BigQuery because 
They have a live extracted data set of Ethereum and a couple of other ledgers on Google Cloud. Um, and this incurs a cost. So I think I recently checked, I've never personally used it, but I've checked and it seems for every terabyte of data that's being processed, uh, you have to pay like $5. But in a real analysis scenario where you're testing queries and uh, perhaps run through the entire chain, you can easily yeah, get to a couple hundred dollars for such an analysis. Um, the uh, underlying technology that uh, this big Google BigQuery dataset um, is using is called Ethereum ETL. And that's a Python-based um, yeah, command line tool that allows you to extract data from, uh, from, a, from a client that is fully synchronized with the network. And so what you can do is uh, on the top right here, you can run Ethereum ETL on your own node or any, any node, ideally an archive node, um, that, uh, and that would produce the same data set that Google BigQuery has, but then you have it locally. Um, and in addition, um, it allows you to also extract data from other ledgers. For example, the Binance Smart Chain, um, you would also be able to uh, extract data from there because it's not basically uh, the underlying technology is just the same for, for, the, for the data. But, uh, and I've mentioned it again and again now, um, the downside is you need to have an archive node. Um, and in the next slide, we'll, we'll take a look what that means. But before that, um, I quickly want to mention, you can also, if you have access to such a full or archive node, you can use the JSON RPC access that it provides in itself. And this allows you yeah, to run a wide range of queries um, and gives you full flexibility to check out any even underlying states um, that, are, that are stored on the ledger. Um, and uh, this would even go beyond what um, Ethereum ETL can tell you. So, but again, downside here is you need to have such an archive node. Now, that tool produces a data set structure um, that consists of uh, these fields. So you have blocks, transactions, traces. Um, this is what we've covered already. Um, and then uh, you can also look at receipts. So for example, each transaction that you have in the transaction data set, you'll see uh, what, for example, the um, input gas was. So what was the sender willing to pay for this transaction? But then in the receipts, you would actually see um, how much gas was, was really consumed um, by that transaction. And that's not something you can know upfront because due to the quasi-Turing completeness of the EVM, um, it's hard to forecast how much gas you will actually be using in, in, in very specific detail, at least. And finally, it will also produce logs and uh, can also produce contracts that uh, so these smart contracts, uh, byte codes, for example, and produces some other nice summary statistics such as balances, token transfers, and so on. And if you want to run this, then it looks something like on the bottom right here. Um, so you can say, for example, you want to export blocks and transactions from some starting block to some end block. Uh, and you specify some provider. So that's the, uh, the node that you have access to and then where you want to output this. And on the left, there's some nice uh, DB diagram if you kind of better want to understand um, how that structure looks like, what all of the fields are. Uh, and uh, you can click that link in the presentation which was on the website. So, um, what are the actual node requirements if you think about running something like this yourself? Um, so a light client node doesn't really make sense because it doesn't really store all of the information that you want to access, but full nodes and archive nodes can be interesting. And so a full node uh, is of course fully synchronized with the network, um, copies and verifies all transactions, but in terms of the state that it uh, yeah, keeps, it's only the past 128 blocks. So it doesn't keep the historical states of, of say, yeah, something that happened in, in 2020. Um, if you wanted to look that up, uh, what was the balance of a certain account at that time, then that would not allow you to look that up. Um, 
and and so uh, if you if you want to set up something like this for Ethereum at least, um, then that would require a disk space of something like one terabyte, ideally an SSD disk, but I think it still works on an HDD as well. Um, but if you want to run an archive node that keeps all historical states and allows you to yeah, extract all of that information and all the traces as well, um, then you're looking at quite yeah, larger uh, hardware requirements. So um, I'm personally running one of these and uh, at least for Ethereum, uh, you need an SSD for this and it's currently needing eight terabytes plus in terms of disk space. But there are free and paid nodes available if you don't want to do this yourself. And I've uh, added two links here where you can uh, look these up. Um, they have different pricing models. Um, and uh, during the course of this tutorial, we'll be using a free node. Um, and uh, the one that I can recommend is uh, by moralis.io. Um, and so I've uh, added a screenshot here. Um, I think we're not that many uh, participants. So um, even though I would suggest uh, for the exercises that you get your own uh, access key by signing up here, it doesn't cost anything, no need to specify credit card details or anything. But uh, I think it will just work if you um, follow with the, uh, with the endpoint that is already in the notebooks later on. And so the, the free version here allows you to send something like 10 million requests per month, which I think is quite a lot, and even 25 requests per second. So this is fairly decent. Um, I don't believe that this will be available for years in the future, but um, for now, this is pretty good. Right, and so you could you could copy your endpoints uh, from, from here. So uh, we'll now be looking at uh, a number of exercises um, that I've prepared as Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, if you want to run them on your own as well, then uh, you can take a look at the uh, yeah, GitHub repo that we have um, linked from our website. Um, but you'll need to kind of uh, make some setup preparations. Um, so I would recommend uh, follow along here. And if you kind of want to play around with this, either you've already prepared it or um, you can do it at a later stage. So in the first instance, we'll be experimenting with that JSON RPC interface of a node. Um, and so uh, we'll be showing you how to extract blocks and transactions there uh, in a live fashion. And then we'll, in the second exercise, we'll be studying a simple crypto asset token transfer graph. Um, and yeah, look at one network that I'm quite familiar with um, that contains an airdrop and we'll be studying that. And in the third exercise, we'll be um, looking at NFT sales and spot some wash trading um, on OpenSea. And then finally, uh, since this is all kind of live access from a node, because that's quick and easy to do for the purpose of this, for, for this tutorial, um, I'll also be showing you um, how you can work with uh, data that's generated from Ethereum ETL, especially if you have lots of CSV files generated through that tool and it kind of exceeds your hardware requirements or your, your hardware availability. So to start out, um, let's jump into the first notebook. Um, I hope you can still see my, uh, my browser here. Uh, maybe I should make it even a little larger. So um, in this first example, we'll be exploring how to access data from such an Ethereum node. And uh, as I said, it would make sense if you create your own account with Morales.io to get your own endpoint URL. I think we're going to be fine here. Um, but uh, so that's the first thing that we'll be specifying. And then uh, we can very basically, for example, make, make raw requests. So we can construct uh, with the request module and, and JSON um, just sending our own individual requests to this. Uh, and then, um, for example, uh, we want to use the method that's called ETH get block by number. So we can specify that method and then pass the hexadecimal version of a certain block. And uh, extract that information. So here we'll be trying to extract the block number 50,010, which is admittedly one of the 
very early blocks that existed in the Ethereum blockchain. But uh, for the purpose of, of this exercise, this is useful because it's not too much data that this produces. But so then you can see, OK, um, you can see some information about the block itself. It has a certain difficulty, a gas limit, so kind of the restriction how many transactions with a certain complexity are allowed in that, how much gas was actually used, um, who is the miner, and so on and so forth. And then uh, we can also check, okay, how many transactions were in this uh, in this block, and it's just two in this case. Um, and we can also take a look how that looks like. Um, and so we'll see, okay, it references this block that it was inside uh, with a certain block hash, uh, a certain block number, um, and then which address was this transaction sent from, uh, which address was it sent to, um, what was the value that was being sent, and so on and so forth. Um, and here are some additional values that, that are related to the ECDSA signature. It's not that important, but if you really want to find out, here's a nice link. Now, at this point, it's kind of becoming clear that these, these values here mostly contain hexadecimal uh, numbers, and that's somewhat unwieldy. And so uh, to have them automatically parsed and also write less code, we'll be using now Web3Py uh, as a Python package to do essentially the same thing, um, to uh, get a certain block of that block number that we previously specified. And then uh, it's, it's not a regular JSON format anymore. It's not an attribute dictionary. Um, but you can see the numbers have now been parsed, so you can better interpret them, for example. So for example, um, yeah, we can now see that the gas limit has a certain number in gas used and so on. And uh, if we look at uh, an individual transaction, um, then we now also have a value that's actually a number. Um, it seems quite large, but we'll get to that back in, in a moment. One thing to notice is that um, you can see that now the uh, from address and to address are now partially with uppercase letters. And this is something to pay attention to because mm, these are the checksum versions of the lowercase addresses. In this case, sensitivity is used for checksum validation. Um, it kind of works with the underlying binary Ketchak 256 hash and so on. And that's how it's constructed. And the idea is that uh, if you as a regular user look at a certain address, that might um, be easier for you to tell is it the correct address that you're looking at or not. But for the purpose of the analysis, it's really important that um, you don't mix these uppercase uh, versions with lowercase versions. So always just stick to one variant because otherwise you may end up with networks or you, know, you have multiple accounts that are actually the same. So let's turn that result into a data frame um, because I think most people uh, who, who visit this conference uh, are familiar with, with data frames and can then easily work with data like that. And so, uh, that's how that would look like. And so finally, we'll take a look at these large numbers. Um, it turns out uh, that the unit that you see here is actually in way. And uh, yeah, Ethereum has like for each uh, ether um, denomination, a different name. Um, but so one ether corresponds to 10 to the power of 18 way. And so we could convert that column accordingly. Um, just divided by 10 to the power of 18, then we would see, okay, that transaction actually sent 1,900 ether and that one sent 500 ether, coincidentally to the same address. Now, of course, that was in the early days. So at that time, that should have been about $2,000 and $500 maybe. So that would be quite different today. So um, that's the first part. Um, I'll briefly uh, get back to, to the slides and I wanna show you this. So this is another free node provider um, or actually most, mostly paid as far as I know, but they have a very interesting documentation that tells you about all of these uh, um, RPC methods um, that you can call. 
And so uh, this is how that website looks like. Um, and so what we've used is this ETH get blocked by number. And then it also shows you um, how can you do that with uh, Web 3 Pi? How could you do it on the command line um, or in, in different versions? And the nice thing about this is uh, since it has all of these here, uh, this would allow you to yeah, even extract uh, underlying storage variables and so on. But uh, are there any questions at this point, by the way, before I move on to, to the next exercise? Okay, no questions. Then uh, we'll move to the next exercise, which is on uh, extracting token transfers. So in this exercise, uh, we'll be extracting events, namely transfer events of a single token contract. So what we've previously seen was kind of a native uh, currency transaction, but now we want to look at the uh, yeah, um, crypto assets that are implemented as smart contracts. And so, uh, We'll first extract that data, and then uh, we'll look into some more detail of uh, what that network actually consists of. So again, uh, we'll just be specifying that endpoint, um, check if it's running and working, it does. Uh, and then we specify a certain contract address, a token contract address. And what I always recommend, by the way, is um, to use etherscan to kind of uh, yeah, find out um, interesting things in a live fashion. So you could copy paste that address, uh, go to etherscan.io and then uh, paste it here and find out, okay, this seems to be a, a token contract. Um, its name is Bionic uh, and there were some transfers even 12 days ago, but most of them are quite some time back. Um, right, so we'll be specifying that we want to get all of the transfers from that, um, but in a certain range. So here I've specified that I want to get uh, the transfers between block 6 million and then uh, the subsequent 300,000 blocks. Uh, and then we'll try to extract this uh, in, in chunks because uh, the free node Morales um, only lets us request ranges of 2,000 uh, blocks. And so we can run this and I've already started it, but it will only take less than a minute. And then uh, we essentially repeatedly call the, the method get logs from a certain block to a certain block um, of a certain token contract address. And we want to get events that are of this form. So there are transfer events um, that consist of this signature. So meaning there is one address and another address, meaning this is the source and this is the target. And then some amount of tokens have been sent. And so uh, we can run this here and it's uh, almost complete. Um, and then uh, we have all of these logs uh, as a big uh, JSON object. So now we want to parse it because uh, if we look at it, uh, how, it how it looks like um, in terms of the, the structure, then you would again just see something like this. Uh, so you see, okay, um, it has, so, so there are multiple events and they consist of topics and then values for this field, for that field and, and for, the, for the final one. Um, and we want to parse it because we know, okay, this is actually an address, but it's somehow prefixed with a lot of zeros. Same thing for that. Um, and so, because that would be a little bit tedious to do manually, um, we'll just be um, parsing it with uh, a so-called application binary interface. And um, to, to quickly talk about this, um, when smart contracts are being developed, um, they're usually developed in high level languages like Solidity and then they're compiled to EVM bytecode so that they can be deployed. But accessing that bytecode functionality, for example, through transactions um, uh, would, would be difficult if you had to specify the entry points of the bytecode. So instead it would be nice if you could use 
the function names um, of the high level language store. And this is where the application binary interface comes in. Um, it provides information on function and event signatures that have been implemented. Um, and that allows for translation to these bytecode entry points. And so uh, EVM smart contract developers usually generate this ABI for their code. And then even more frequently, they, they upload this to popular block explorers like Etherscan. And so if we look at this um, again for this, for this token contract, then we can see, oh, okay, they uploaded the high level source code of how this crypto asset, this token works. Um, and they've also uploaded this contract ABI um, so that it's easier to use it. So uh, we'll use a reduced version of this ABI, namely only the common uh, denominator, meaning only the transfer event that's present in most of these uh, token contracts that, that follow a standard named ERC20. And uh, it basically just says, well, it has a certain name. Uh, it's a type of event and it contains three fields, namely one address, which is the from address, uh, another address, which is the to address, and then uh, a value of tokens that have been sent, which is this 256-bit uh, unsigned integer. And so uh, we can, we can uh, read this ABI into Web3Pi and then uh, with that ABI, parse the event logs and create our own custom format because the internal format is, is a little bit nested, um, but it's really basic, essentially just uh, um, extract the arguments um, of, of each of these events. And so having done that, uh, we can then again create a Pandas data frame. And so now we have uh, almost 17,000 transfer events just from this one token contract. And you can see again, okay, we have all the fields. It's a it's transfer event type, uh, belongs to a, a, a certain block that was contained and has of course some transaction hash that you can use to look it up. Um, and then uh, again, from to and these values. So, with that, um, we can create a token transfer graph with network X. And I guess a lot of you are familiar with, with how that works, um, but the gist of it is just, um, that's how you can start looking at this from a network perspective. You could, for example, compute some node measures like the in degree, out degree, or in degree centrality of, of the nodes. And here I've just outputted um, some values that are a bit more interesting. And you can already see, Oh, there seems to be one account that has a very large out degree. So um, having shown that, um, we'll now uh, briefly take a look at uh, this network from a visual perspective. So um, what you usually would do is uh, if you have extracted such data, it can make sense to kind of visualize it. And, and popular tools, how to do that is, for example, with Gephi. And uh, there are very good tutorials even on YouTube um, on how to use Gephi. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can kind of interactively explore the networks there. However, most tools are kind of restricted to how large the graphs can be that, it, that, they, that they support. And so I, my, from my personal experience, uh, if you're going beyond something like 200,000 vertices in, in Gephi, then yeah, you're running into trouble and it's getting really slow. So <clears throat> for larger graphs, um, we're currently developing uh, another tool called the Token Gallery, which I hope to soon have uh, yeah, made public at this GitHub link. Um, and uh, I'll be showing you a brief version of that um, just right now of this particular token network that we're looking at. So this is that um, Bionic token network. And you would arrive at a, at a similar visualization if you did it with Gephi. Um, but so that node that had a very large out degree seems to be that central node here. And so it, yeah, this is just a sample of the edges, but it sends a lot of uh, tokens to all sorts of addresses. But interestingly, 
um, there seem to be uh, some other hubs here that uh, yeah receive um, many tokens. So let's let's click for example just this one. So you can see okay somehow this uh, account here received um, these tokens from this node and then moved it forward to this other address. And if we look at some of the other ones, then that seems to be similar. Interesting. So if we want to more systematically look at this um, from a yeah, from, from a data perspective, um, we can study this. So suppose we know already um, that in this particular token network, we are actually looking at an, at an airdrop. So there were tokens that were distributed for free um, and people only had to sign up for it, for example, through some Google forms. And so what you could then do is, okay, try to find out which address has air, airdropped tokens likely um, by, by grouping uh, from a, by the from address and the value. And then you would see, okay, this particular address here seems to have sent this many tokens uh, almost 10,000 times to different addresses. Um, so in all likelihood, um, this is probably some airdropping node um, that, yeah, just spent these tokens on, on lots of different accounts. Now we can also ask, okay, who's receiving tokens of the same value multiple times? And then interestingly, you can see, okay, there seem to be some accounts that received them even more than a thousand times or several hundred times, which might point to the idea that uh, there are participants in this network who do this very systematically uh, to just get it lots of times. So, um, we could now um, try to uh, find out which of these accounts yeah, likely belong to the same entity. If we assume, for example, um, someone who has uh, collected this multiple times here, then maybe this entire group um, is likely just a single user. So how we would go about that um, is, we would uh, first choose that airdrop distributing node, which we've, we've just looked at, um, and what value had been sent. And then only consider a subgraph of these airdrop value transfers. So only those where we have like uh, these 25 billion uh, tokens being sent again and again. And then uh, we uh, um, construct a subgraph starting from this airdrop distributing node going two hops out, um, but exclude the distributor itself. So that would uh, hopefully yield us just the nodes um, that we see here and these final nodes here that receive them. So if we do that, um, then we can see, okay, uh, there are, seem to be multiple intermediaries that indeed say, send to the same target address. Uh, and there are thousands of these cases. Um, and so to be a little bit conservative about this entire approach, let's uh, restrict the groups to only those that have collected at least uh, yeah, 10 of these airdrops because maybe some other scenario was by coincidence. So if we do that, um, then it doesn't change much. There are still thousands of these cases where, it hap where it's happening. And then uh, finally, we can um, yeah, extract entities from that by um, essentially uh, creating a new graph out of it. So this um, intermediary to target node ad, uh, graph. And then uh, yeah, uh, for each connected component that we find, so for each disconnected subgraph, um, give that group a label saying that's probably one entity. And so if we do that, uh, then it turns out there are uh, 40 of these subgraphs or 41. Um, and so it's quite likely that there are something like 41 entities that have used a total of yeah, more than 5,000 addresses. Now, there are some caveats that I left out here um, because it could be possible that um, in such a network that for example, is such a central node here, 
that receives addresses many times is some service, for example, uh, an exchange. Um, and so in the, uh, uh, in the work um, where I've uh, did this systematically, uh, I've accounted for something like this. And you can find more details on this in, in this paper. And I will also have code um, that implements uh, this heuristic as well as some other ones more systematically. And to show you how the end result of that would look like, um, this is the same network, then you would be able to, to tell, okay, uh, these groups uh, are likely just controlled by one entity. Um, and also there's an exchange over here um, and we can also label their addresses uh, belonging to them through some other heuristics. Okay, are there any questions up until this point? No questions either, I assume, okay. Okay, then we'll be uh, looking at the next exercise, which is on NFT wash trading. So um, I'm sure you've heard about NFTs before. Um, and uh, I've also previously uh, briefly outlined uh, what wash trading is and how it works. Um, but in this case, uh, we'll be looking at uh, crypto assets of the NFT type. And specifically, um, uh, I've, I've recently been pointed to um, something like this here, it's on OpenSea. Uh, they're called audio glyphs, um, which are not just pictures, but apparently uh, they are music mm -hmm. NFTs. Um, and Someone pointed me to this and said, well, that looks really weird what's going on here. There are transfers that seem to be between the same type of people, um, but they're not really sales. What's going on here? So I wanna take this um, as a starting point um, to look at uh, this particular uh, NFT collection and see whether we can spot something. So again, uh, we'll be trying to extract events. So in this case, uh, OpenSea emits orders matched events, and uh, we'll need to extract those. And at the same time, we'll also need to extract uh, NFT transfer events. And so uh, we're doing that uh, in, in conjunction. So we'll load again the endpoint, connect to it, uh, and then first get all of the uh, transaction hashes of audio glyphs NFT transfers, because we can't go through all of the OpenSea uh, orders matched events because there are just too many and we're only interested in this particular NFT here. So uh, we get all of the transaction hashes within, again, a small range uh, of what we've just seen on that website. Um, and so we get just 39 transactions uh, with transfers. And for each of these transaction hashes, we can then check um, are there, in addition to these transfers, are there any orders matched events that are contained in these transactions? So that means the NFT has changed hands, but at the same time, OpenSea said that was actually a sale. So you can combine these two data sets and then be able to tell um, which were NFT sales and which were just NFT transfers. So we'll, begin, we'll be doing this quite similar to uh, how we did it in the previous exercise. We'll be specifying an OpenSea uh, contract address. We'll be loading the uh, uh, application binary interfaces um, and then create our custom log structure. And then for each uh, transaction hash of the 39, get all the events that were contained in there. And so then uh, we can create uh, a pandas data frame again out of this. Uh, and join the two data sets. So what we end up with then is that we can look at, and I've just printed the head here. Uh, we have, um, yeah, transfers um, or sales of, of a particular NFT ID. So what I've shown here, um, that is one NFT ID, um, this 1,935. 
Um, and then we can see, was that actually a sale or was it just a transfer? And here I'm grouping by uh, how often did these participants uh, send that particular NFT in that direction. So we can already see apparently there was a sale from this address to this other address seven times. Um, and then uh, the other way around happened six times. Okay, uh, seems promising. Um, so let's look at it from a network perspective and actually plot uh, how that looks like. So we can then see um, kind of marked with each NFT ID, or ID that we see in, these, uh, in, in this time range that this particular token ID, NFT ID 1935 has apparently been circled here between these nodes and between these nodes as well. And so the colors of these edges here now indicate blue, meaning it's a, it's a sale and green, it's a transfer. So to get a little bit less clutter here, um, let's just uh, take a look at only those um, of this particular NFT ID 1935. And then we see, okay, it happened here and it happened here. But interestingly, in between, it got transferred. So these are extremely simple uh, cyclical trades um, just designed to increase the trading volume on OpenSea. Um, but in between, there was a transfer. But we, and, and then it, it finally ended up at, at this account down here. We don't know anything about that, but I would say we can be quite certain that at least these accounts here probably belong to the same entity. Maybe even all of these belong to the same entity. But at least for the final one, I'm not so sure. Maybe that was actually the victim in the end who thought, oh, that's apparently some very interesting NFT. So uh, interestingly now, um, this is extremely basic in terms of how the scheme works. And so uh, it turns out that um, OpenSea doesn't list these as sales. But actually, the blockchain tells us these were sales. And so I recently talked to a journalist about this who contacted OpenSea, and it seems very probable, although they were hesitant to say it, um, that they are already trying to fight wash trading by simply hiding this from the user interface. So they're not showing these wash trades anymore. And you can also look at kind of the overall statistics here kind of how much uh, trading volume was overall generated and you won't find these particular sales here anymore. So seems like it's making progress that they're already trying to fight this. But then again, that is extremely basic. And uh, I think all of us here can think easily of approaches how this could be a little bit harder to detect. Right, um, any questions about this particular case? Also no questions. Okay, then uh, yeah, maybe in the end, um, if, if something kind of com comes up, we can also go back to this. Um, but then I would move to uh, the final part. Um, so uh, let me quickly check if I have anything else here. No. Um, so we'll now we're looking at how can you actually work with data that you can extract from Ethereum ETL. So. In the past examples, we've kind of interactively extracted data um, in a notebook. Uh, but if you want to make some larger scale analysis, then yeah, of course, you need to extract lots of data first and then take a more detailed look. And so uh, in the repository, I've added a data directory um, where you can see uh, yeah, outputs of, of these commands here. Um, so with some endpoint um, where you can also use uh, the, the Morales endpoint, if you like, uh, extract some blocks, transactions, um, and then also receipts and logs. And so uh, let's assume we've done this 10 times, meaning we actually have, uh, oops, not this one. Um, we have like lots of CSV files. Uh, and in this case, they're all pretty small, but in reality, uh, you can imagine uh, maybe each file is a gigabyte or more. Uh, and then 
if you wanted to run some analysis, it might get tricky. So uh, what I can recommend um, on how to work with this is using the Python library Dask. Uh, and Dask allows you to read multiple files and work with the asset out of core, meaning um, if, for example, your pandas data frame doesn't fit into memory, um, then you're kind of at a loss. But if you work with Dask, then you can load data sets that are larger than what your memory is actually able to do. And so uh, Dask is, is lazy, meaning you can perform all sorts of transformations, very similar to pandas, not 100% not the same, but quite similar. Um, and only once you run uh, compute or head, meaning you want to get some actual output, then everything is computed. And also, uh, and I haven't covered this here, but uh, Dask also has a way to run in a distributed fashion. So you could have multiple worker nodes um, and uh, use distributed data frames in a very similar fashion to how you are familiar with pandas. And so uh, we'll be loading this here just quickly. And then we can load, for example, all of the blocks and compute that. And then you can see, OK, we've loaded uh, 1,100 uh, blocks um, with, with the information. And then uh, we'll be loading logs. And as I've told you, logs contain these events, such as transfer events or this order matched event. And uh, it's not really practical to rely here on Web3Py um, to, to parse these events um, because uh, it's, it's somehow slow. Um, so uh, what we're doing here now is uh, we more manually filter through these events and uh, yeah, try to extract transfer events. But you could imagine the same thing with other types of events. And I think this is kind of, in general, the promising area of research is looking at different types of events and applications and, and study what's going on there. And so what we're doing here is transfer by this, uh, by this um, event log, uh, filter, filter by this event log. And then, uh, yeah, um, get all the topics that um, match it and have a length of three values. So just like this. And so uh, if we do that, it's lazily evaluated. So we don't see any output yet. Um, we still need to parse um, the, uh, the, the fields. So if you remember from this very first exercise um, where we've looked at, uh, kind of these, uh, this raw information, um, then we still need to parse uh, the, the uh, um, individual fields, meaning cutting off prefixes and so on. So I've added a couple of helper functions here um, where we can transform hexadecimal values to integers, um, extract addresses from uh, these hexadecimal values that are prefixed with zeros. Uh, and kind of a general function to parse the field, which just uses these two. And so that then in turn allows us to uh, extract the from, to, and value fields of these uh, token transfers. And then finally, we can run everything. And that's when I run compute. And then we can take a look. And so now we have 140,000 transfer events. Um, with all the information, which uh, token contract emitted the transfer event from which account to which other account um, and what the value was. Right. And so uh, that's how you can do that. Um, and with that, I'm also at the end of uh, this exercise. Um, if you want to experiment with this yourself, um, here are some good starting exercises. Uh, for example, you may want to join timestamps to this. Timestamps are contained in the blocks. Uh, or you can try and figure out how can you sum up total sent and received uh, tokens. And as a hint, this is not really straightforward because you're dealing with very large numbers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, you either go for losing some precision, or you need to implement some more involved tactics. Right. 
but this is uh, in the end of the presentation, unless there are any questions, um, of course, to this last exercise. But if not, um, then I think uh, we can move to uh, the last part of this tutorial. Okay. So we're now at the outlook. Um, so the things that we're we've been showing you are kind of um, as we've originally introduced for uh, yeah, be beginners to intermediate intermediate uh, skilled uh, yeah people who want to analyze this. Um, but of course, uh, there are kind of hot topics at the moment of interesting things that can be analyzed and also be uh, published about. And so, I would I would say the entire decentralized finance space is uh, very interesting. Um, there are automated market maker decentralized exchanges. Uh, there are phenomena like flash loans, liquidations, arbitrage, um, minor extractable value, algorithmic trading in general. Um, there haven't been that many works uh, on on this yet, but uh, the uh, I would say the community that actually does it um, is quite advanced already. Um, I'm just not talking too much about it. And then of course, the whole field of risk analysis, uh, uh, in which direction um, Bernhard and myself have also started looking into. Then of course, and I've briefly covered it already, uh, NFTs are a huge hot topic um, and uh, kind of, uh, I would say criminal activity in the context of NFTs is also quite interesting. And then there are scaling protocols, layer two uh, uh, protocols um, that, I would say so far have seen very few works. Um, and the question is kind of, do people interact with them differently? And of course, alternative blockchains as well. So I've previously mentioned the uh, Binance Smart Chain, for example, um, which I think uh, is quite interesting because it has lots of activity and actually has, in terms of the data that's contained in it, much more than what's going on on Ethereum. Um, but at the same time, I would say it's quite likely that the number of scams on there is much higher as well. Um, but that would be very interesting to study. And then uh, I personally think um, decentralized autonomous organizations, um, so the whole governance processes that are being implemented as uh, applications and smart contracts on top of uh, these distributed ledgers are quite interesting. and. Um, we're all already seeing uh, yeah, early phenomena like bribing techniques um, that try to yeah, uh, convince people to vote in a certain way if they get money for it. Uh, and um, yeah, this hasn't been studied in detail yet at all. And then of course, uh, there are uh, alternative DLT use cases in general, so for which distributed ledger technologies can be used. And um, I see there, for example, IoT uh, blockchains as being interesting, but also stuff like um, identity management is, is, a, is a rising topic. And there haven't been many works looking at this yet at all. So to be a little bit more specific in the, in the DeFi case here, I can make one example. People, for example, uh, use DeFi applications like Curve Finance, and you can find uh, yeah, guides like this on Twitter, where people recommend certain strategies, how you can make money um, by uh, yeah, uh, repeatedly investing in, in certain DeFi protocols, uh, which leads to compounding effects. And uh, yeah, how that actually uh, is being used and what the effects are and what the risks are is something that just hasn't been studied yet in depth at all. And so, uh, kind of tying back to this IoT use case, um, there's also uh, a chain called Helium, for example, which even tries to um, yeah, uh, organize its, um, its mining process or validation process around uh, physical location of nodes that cover certain areas 
um, this is kind of new and emerging um, and it's only taking off and I'm not aware of research works that have looked at something, at, at something like this. And then maybe as a almost final slide, um, I think there are some general challenges. So Bernhard has already shown you that uh, he has a, a set of um, community curated labels for addresses, but we need much more of these and uh, also have kind of yeah, systematic data sets that can be used for benchmarking um, so that we can develop uh, detection methods uh, or algorithms that we can then compare. Uh, and the whole field of address clustering, I think, still has a lot of potential because um, there, are, there are likely many application-specific um, address clustering heuristics that could be developed. And finally, um, I've now kind of shown you in this tutorial how you can access data somewhat efficiently, but uh, in, from my perspective, it's a growing problem that the sizes of these data sets just grow so large that it gets difficult, especially for yeah, researchers who are starting out new in this field to deal with it. Um, and so my, my own Ethereum data set that I have on my server is already two terabytes in size. And if you look at something like the Binance Smart Chain, then it's easily more than four terabytes. And then maybe you've heard of uh, um, chains like Solana um, that yeah, claim to have a very high throughput are probably at the same time quite centralized, but their data is even larger than this. And so, um, yeah, that kind of raises questions. How can you deal with this data? How can you selectively um, extract data for, for those uh, analysis scenarios that you find interesting? I want to close with this slide um, to have kind of a word cloud here of uh, potentially interesting topics, or maybe you could call them buzzwords. Um, but uh, I've created this from yeah, a number of articles uh, um, of the, uh, I think it's called the Binance Academy um, that introduces lots of topics. And uh, I think many of these uh, can be interesting starting points for future analysis. Right, and with that, um, I'd be happy if we could have some open discussion or maybe you have some questions that you'd like to see answered. Um, we still have some time for that, but yeah. Are there any questions regarding this topic or more general questions about crypto assets, blockchains? We can also take them. Oh, sorry. Um, so can you hear me? Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, no, um, first, uh, I wanted to thank you both. It was a very interesting uh, talk, uh, both the theoretical uh, parts and uh, um, the new tools I've seen were, I think, would be very useful. So uh, thank you about that. I just had one uh, last question, uh, was more related to GraphSense. Uh, I was wondering if you were considering using uh, the GraphSense uh, and the representation on other blockchain um, apart, um, apart from Bitcoin, let's say account uh, model blockchains. Yes, so conceptually, GraphSense already supports account model ledgers like Ethereum. So you can also look into Ethereum, at least into external transactions. And what we are currently doing is we also um, want to support uh, so-called internal transactions or messages so that you can also uh, investigate token networks, for instance. So this is our next step. So it's on the agenda. Okay, nice, thank you. And we keep uh, track. And again, the idea is to, so we introduced account model ledger support last year, and the idea is to really support both worlds and come up with a generic solution for both worlds. And also the reason why we have chosen systems like Cassandra and Spark um, is simply what, what, what Friedhelm said. So the data volumes are growing tremendously and uh, I think the only way to keep track of this or to keep pace is to have some horizontally scalable technology in place. Oh, 
Okay, thank you. Hey Bernard, uh, hey Victor. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. I missed uh, most of your presentation. It was night here and I was... Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, sorry about that, but maybe you discussed. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, first of all, thanks. Uh, thanks for this wonderful presentation and insights on Gapsense. It's very insightful. Um, so, um, question is uh, about internal uh, transactions. Um, how do you deal with internal transactions? Um, uh, how do you store uh, those internal transactions, or do you run EVM behind, or do you extract? Uh, them from ETL, Ethereum ETL. I, I don't think so. Ethereum ETL provides you with that. But so the question was more: How do we get? Uh, how do you get smart contract related transactions? Okay, so, um, so let me rephrase the question just to make sure I understand it. Um, you want to know how can you get internal transactions um, right. that are related to smart contracts? Right. 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 So uh, what you need is, uh, first of all, uh, an Ethereum archive node. Yeah. Um, so that needs to be uh, fully synchronized because these, uh, these internal transactions, they are not stored in, in, a, regular, in a regular full node or so, node at all. Right. So, so just a comment here. Uh, so your Ethereum ETL is basically configured to this uh, uh, archive node that you internally run. So it can also run. It can also run with full nodes, but then uh, what it can extract is somewhat limited. So you can still extract regular transactions. Mm -hmm. um, you can still extract the events, uh, but you can't extract the internal transactions anymore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but but Ethereum ETL has a command line functionality to extract these internal transactions if you have access to such an archive node, and. Uh, you can even use this uh, Morales service, for example, that I've uh, briefly introduced, um, and that would allow you to extract internal transactions, as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, and so on the GraphSense side, uh, what we do is at the moment, we just have the external transactions, but we are already working on also gathering the internal transactions uh, to also cover this part. It's work in progress. Okay. Sorry, if we have time, I just on sure. this uh, last uh, uh, question. So let's say I wanted to use Morales to recover uh, the data. Um, uh, how much time uh, is it going to take me to, let's say, recover one year? let's say in the, the last year, for example. So just an idea of how much uh, it makes uh, sense to rely on Morales, uh, or uh, if I need to do more for bigger studies, uh, if I need to move on, let's put it this way. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So I can't tell you for Morales uh, itself because I, I haven't uh, used it for extracting something like a year of data. But what I can tell you is uh, another case um, that I've recently done. So I've used, uh, I, I wanted to extract data from the Binance Smart Chain, which contains a lot more uh, data, of course. And so uh, since I actually don't have the uh, hardware to run my own full archive node, uh, what I ended up doing is uh, using uh, a number of public nodes. So very similar to what Morales offers. And just uh, yeah, via the network, uh, extracted all the data from them. Um, and so this has been running something like seven to 10 days for me to get four terabytes of data. Um, so I think if you just want to get something like a year of data from Ethereum uh, and you use uh, an endpoint like, like like Morales, then maybe it can be done in a couple of days, but meaning you have to run it on a server, run it nonstop, run it in chunks. Uh, and also um, kind of when it gets more practical, um, I think it makes sense to have your own scripts around it so that, uh, yeah, if you notice, um, a certain chunk has failed downloading that you re-download it again, stuff like that. Because I mean, if it's all via the network, 
there is some chance that it fails. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Just to add yeah. to your question. Yeah, go on. Just, just to add to your question. So this is also what we were thinking of some years ago, some years ago, and we, we noticed that we are again and again need the same kind of data for answering different types of research questions. And this was actually our motivation for, for building graphs, right? So that you have a platform where you're interested in data and then you can uh, quite efficiently extract the data. I mean, it, it takes quite some effort to get the things up and running, honestly, but as soon as you have it, and if you repeatedly need it, it it's, it's worth the effort, I would say, um, to do it once. Yeah, I mean, and then of course there is always the option of going for um, this Google BigQuery solution. Um, and I mean, yesterday in the in the workshop, uh, we've we've seen one uh, presenter talk about how they use that, and it seemed to have worked well. Uh, yeah, I mean the the BigQuery solution. My my fear was the um, let's say the the building part of it if there wasn't some so uh, there were some let's call it horror stories about uh, people forgetting yeah, or, yeah. so since uh, I wanted to also make this work with students then you know uh, it may become uh, dangerous absolutely. Actually, that way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I agree that uh, I mean the, the, the both the solutions are both uh, interesting I will see how to set that on. Set that up. Sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I mean, uh, one thing I was curious about because um, in uh, our uh, research, uh, we were looking into blockchain online social media. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but basically, you have uh, social media platforms that are, are run on blockchain. And uh, you have both the classical social media actions, follow comments and so on that are recorded on blockchain, but also you have the cryptocurrency running, um, helping, you know, so used for uh, uh, payments, uh, rewarding users and so on. And yeah, I was curious if you were uh, familiar with this. So if you were considering maybe expanding on that, because we are working on it we, we set up the let's say the data construction sorry the, the, the data retrieval connecting with different nodes and so on but uh, we were missing some tool to analyze it with this kind of like a graph sense is doing right so we were looking at some solutions on our, of our own but now i see that you have basically what i had in mind already decided and uh, already constructing graph sense I don't know if I have uh, expressed a bit what I am trying to convey is the following. If you have already, if you are familiar with blockchain online social media, if you are not, if you think it would be interesting to branch into this kind of uh, analysis, or if you're open to collaborate, something like that. I, I, I would have a question, if I may. Um, yeah, so, sure. Uh, which, which social media platform are we talking about? Uh, so uh, in the works I've published, uh, uh, we're mainly about uh, Steemit. I don't know if you... Steemit, okay, okay, okay. great. And uh, yeah, so we were uh, working on Steemit and uh, the other platform called Hive, which was born from it. Mm -hmm. Hive is the fork, right? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I was curious if you, I mean, since you are familiar, if you were thinking about maybe studying them as well. I think I think that, I think this is quite interesting. One of the things that I heard about this is that there are schemes, at least on uh, on Steemit uh, at the beginning, um, that somehow, yeah, uh, people try to get their stuff more popular than it really is. And so I wonder if there's kind of all similar to, uh, yeah, kind of this um, behavior where you just use multiple accounts and then, yeah, uh, oh, so try to fake fake some activity. I think that could be interesting to look at. Oh, okay. So there were, um, you, there are speculation of this sort of wash trading, like the ones you have presented. Yeah, it's kind, kind, kind of similar, right? Yeah, okay, okay. 
So I mean, patterns that increase volume. Oh, I see. I mean, uh, not, not just that, but I think, I mean, there is also some underlying, I mean, uh, there's al always some algorithm, right, that drives certain posts to the top. And I think it somehow works with uh, donations for posts on Steemit, if I'm not fully mistaken. I have never really looked into it in detail. But I wonder kind of uh, to what extent that can be gamed and uh, to, what it's, to what extent it's actually happening. Yeah, but, that, yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's, uh, that's correct. Like you have these uh, meme for votes uh, and are based <laughs> mainly on the, um, the amount of currency you are holding so, uh, a certain type of token. So yeah, basically that's a kind of big part, uh, let's say, trying to get uh, those that have a lot of uh, currency to, to vote for your posts uh, and maybe there is some outside trading right you know to to skew uh, let's say the the voting so that I might post uh, get more popular these are phenomena I, that I are think, actually not uh, I, I think it's I think it's definitely interesting um I mean it, it I mean I, I don't have any idea how how popular these two services are at this point but I remember um yeah, when they originally appeared, um, they were quite popular. And I mean, there are other uh, services like these, this, what is it called, DTube, um, this decentralized yes. YouTube yeah. thing and so on. And I feel like uh, these type of applications are kind of you know, gaining more popularity. And therefore, since, since there is this, yeah, there, there is an, there's often an on-chain component that you can analyze in the context of that. And uh, I think that could be quite interesting. Same thing, I mean, in, in the more general uh, definition of that, um, there are, uh, there's this recent thing called GameFi. I'm not sure if it's really established, but it's kind of lends, upon, lends itself from gaming and DeFi. And so okay. these applications uh, that have, I think they also have kind of a social media component, um, but also this uh, DeFi or, or earning or a cryptocurrency component. And I think that could be quite interesting to study as well. Sorry, can you repeat the, the name? So it's, it's not a name of a specific platform, but I think it's a kind of a, a common theme okay. that people tried to have emerge. So similar to how this term decentralized finance, DeFi mm -hmm. exists. Um, some people have started talking about GameFi. So oh, gaming okay. and Decentralized finance. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, search into it. Thank you for these uh, insights. Very uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we still we still have time if, if there are any other questions. Um, no need to rush away, but um, yeah, open ears. Just, just maybe one last comment to build on the previous question. So what we did um, frequently in the past was that sometimes um, researchers investigate something that's uh, connected with, with crypto assets, for instance, um, things that appear in the darknet, and there's a correlation to crypto asset transfers, just as you have now in your case, the social media platforms, and there are some crypt crypto asset associations. And of course, it's always interesting to to let's say build abstractions for both worlds so for for the relations you see in the for instance social media space and also in the crypto asset space and then start correlating things uh, i'm thinking about clustering on the one side and on the other side and see if things match together so you might uh, for instance enhance your clustering in the social media space by just doing the connection to the crypto asset space um, so I think those multi-layer network approaches are very interesting to pursue if you have crypto assets plus something else. Um, and what we always do, with, or what we like to do is when, when we work with others, um, we can easily look into the crypto asset space, construct the networks and help doing the analytics there. So this is the way how we collaborated in the past with others and how we also want to do it in the future. Well, that's that's actually interesting because that's one of the approaches uh, we were uh, working with, uh, um, still on Steemit, but mainly to model the, uh, let's say we had the layer of monetary 
interactions mm. and the layer of uh, social interactions. And we were seeing if there were some sort of uh, interplays. Uh, in particular, we were studying with uh, the fork. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a work we sent, it was accepted recently a website. Um, the idea was to study how the users went from the original platform to the other platform. So we had some studies uh, trying to look at uh, if there was influence of uh, one layer over mm. the, the migration of other layers. So I, I'll, um, I'll definitely keep, keep in mind uh, that uh, graph sense, we can definitely improve uh, our modeling of the monetary side. That's, uh, that's why I was... Uh, yeah. And you can, you can get started with the API and if things are getting more complicated, um, what we usually do is we implement dedicated analytics job in Spark that do the data crunching. So for simple things, you can use the API. Uh, if things are getting more complicated, uh, you should talk to us and we can maybe help you in tailoring uh, more, more sophisticated analytics job. Because usually if you want to do, if you want to compute something, for, you don't want to fetch terabytes of data to your site first. You, yeah. you want to do it directly on the data. Exactly, that makes, uh, that's, that would be perfect. All right, then I will uh, explore a bit more the, the APIs. So mm -hmm. if, you are, if you don't mind me, I will uh, yeah. contact you in case mm -hmm. we have uh, some analysis the... interesting to the API key I used in this tutorial will expire after this tutorial because I want okay. to avoid too many, uh, you know, it's, yes. we have to maintain the platform. So we want to know who is using it, uh, but you just, you can just drop me an email and you get uh, an API key. Oh, which... okay. Uh, what, uh, the, email, the email is in the slides, right? In the contact email. Sorry, I need, I'm not sure. In the chat. Oh, perfect. All right, thank you. So, okay. So then, if there are no thank further you. questions, I think we can close the tutorial. Thanks yeah. for participating, um, and hope we stay in touch. And if there are any further questions, don't hesitate and uh, drop us an email. Same from okay. my side. Thank you much. Thank you very much for participating and uh, thank you. Out if there's anything.